Threats against the LGBTQ plus community have been increasing in recent years across the country and here in the Northwest. Law enforcement agencies are tracking a sharp increase in hate crimes. Meanwhile, the Department of Homeland Security has issued warnings about the potential for attacks on LGBTQ friendly events. And a recent Supreme Court decision has many worried about the potential for discrimination. We've seen the effects locally in everything from hate speech to homicides. But LGBTQ plus folks and their allies say they are not giving up the fight for their rights. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ashley Corslin in for Laurel Porter. Our guests today are from Basic Rights Oregon. They work to ensure that all lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirit, intersex, and asexual Oregonians experience equality. Joining me is Gabby Gardner. They're the statewide engagement manager for Basic Rights. And we have Blair Stenvik, the organization's communications manager. Thank you both for being here today. Well, let's talk a little bit about Basic Rights Oregon and what sort of work you do. Right, um, so we started back in the 90s um, and our mission has always been, uh, as you said at the top there, equality for LGBTQ plus Oregonians. Um, that's changed a lot over the years. You know, when we started, it was really um, to combat these uh, pretty forcefully anti-gay ballot measures that were happening in Oregon and a lot of other states at the time. Um, but, you know, through that, We've um, been kind of advocating for uh, LGBTQ plus uh, equality in policy all the way, you know, through mm -hmm. marriage, through um, expanding transgender health access, anti-discrimination laws, inclusive education. Um, so we do that through uh, advocating at the state level, at the local levels, um, and we also do some leadership development as well. Great, thank you for answering that. Yeah. You know, we've seen a number of uh, high profile anti-LGBTQ bills introduced over the past few years. Uh, according uh, to the Human Rights Campaign, more than 75 anti-LGBTQ plus bills have been signed into law. That's happening in various states just this year, and that's more than double last year, which had already been the worst year on record. So lawmakers, they have banned schools from talking about sexuality and gender identity. Others have tried to ban drag performances, and still others are trying to limit access to gender affirming care. We see that in the headlines a lot, uh, that topic. So the human rights campaign has issued its first ever state of emergency because of this legislation. Uh, what sort of uh, impact does this have? Gabby, maybe you can answer this uh, on LGBTQ plus people. Yeah, I think that it is really disparaging and nationwide with coalition with other um, organizations like ours in different states, they have a really big uphill battle. Um, we're fortunate to be in a state that um, has a supportive majority for, um, for LGBTQ plus Oregonians, but we also know that that is something that could be fleeting. Um, as we saw during the last election cycle, there was a lot of concerns about the outcomes of that election, especially in the governor's race. Um, and we see data from the Trevor Project that a majority of LGBTQ plus people are impacted by political news um, from what's been going on nationally. So a and, lot of concern. And you mentioned um, kind of the state of affairs politically. What sort of legislation are we seeing here that might be concerning to you in Oregon? Right, um, so there were a few bills um, introduced this past legislative session um, uh, in Salem. Um, fortunately, you know, as we've said, we have a pro-LGBTQ uh, plus equality majority in both houses and obviously with our governor, Tina Kotech, so those bills didn't get very far. Um, you know, there were bills like addressing uh, school inclusivity in school mm -hmm. and uh, trans health care. Um, you know, again, they didn't get very far because we have support that we've really worked to build in our government. Um, but I think they kind of send the message regardless that, uh, you know, especially for Oregonians who maybe live in uh, more conservative parts of the state that they can't be comfortable because they're living in places where, uh, you know, their lawmakers elected by the majority of their neighbors uh, it, support these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know, um, on this topic of legislation, the Supreme Court uh, has recently ruled in favor of a web designer who refused to make wedding websites for gay couples. And she said this was because of her Christ Christian religious beliefs. That has caused a lot of concern that perhaps businesses will be allowed to discriminate against LGBTQ plus people specifically. So what sort of work is being done to prevent that sort of thing from happening, that sort of discrimination? Right, so we've been talking to um, some of our national partners about this. I think um, there's still some work being done to figure out what the exact implications of 303 Creative will be. Um, we're 
kind of seeing that it's it seems like a more narrow ruling that won't apply to like all sort of Broadly. business transactions. Sure. Yeah, um, and we're fortunate in Oregon, we do have pretty strong anti-discrimination laws. Um, but we're also, you know, right now also looking at other options to strengthen those always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Gabby, I believe you had mentioned the Trevor Project just a few minutes ago. You know, studies from the Trevor Project has shown that legislation like that really can have an impact on people's mental health. Uh, talk about that, that effect, that impact it yeah. can have. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it sends a message that folks aren't welcome, mm -hmm. either in their schools or in places of public access within their communities. And it's really concerning to see um, LGBTQ folks um, just mere existence as something that could be legislated out of the rights that they have in their state. You know, we're also seeing an increase in hate crimes. Uh, tough to talk about. Recently, a man in southeast Portland uh, was stabbed to death, unfortunately, defending a friend from homophobic slurs. The FBI, as far as data goes, says there was a 70% increase in hate crimes against the LGBTQ plus community. That was in 2021, the most recent data available from the agency. So let's talk about uh, safety. What can be done? What has been done? Where do you think we need to go as far as improving safety for people? It's a big concern, I'm sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, and I think here in Oregon, we've also seen an increase in bias crimes against um, all sorts of groups, or at least reported bias mm -hmm. crimes, according to recent um, statewide data. Um, you know, I think it's important to understand that there is, you know, a link between rhetoric um, and what's being elevated in politics, both national and local, and, um, you know, how people are acting. We can't always draw a straight line, um, but I think if you want to talk about safety, that starts close to home and, mm -hmm. and seeing, okay, what kind of languages am I using, even if, you know, regardless of political views, uh, am I making really like dehumanizing comments? Are, sure. are politicians making these dehumanizing comments? Um, you know, I'm not an expert in public safety, but I think that's one thing I can point to that everyone can think about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you know, uh, the rhetoric, you mentioned that Blair, uh, has been a lot of it, at least nationally, has centered around trans people. Um, talk about that a little bit. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Are things improving? Are we going backwards? Where do we go? Do you want to go, Gabby? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I think um, we've seen reported, I think the New York Times did a, a pretty in-depth piece about this about a month ago that um, the conservatives really identified, uh, you know, anti-trans politics as a wedge issue a couple years ago. They saw it started with sports, um, targeting sports, um, because it was an easy place to spread misinformation and also hit people close to home because, you know, everyone's, most kids do sports. Um, and they used that to build and to uh, ratchet up into a really um, violent movement against trans folks. Um, so I think we can s see pretty clearly that it is a wedge issue. Um, I think there's definitely room for education. I think, um, you know, back when gay marriage wasn't legal yet, um, the, the tipping point was more people realizing that they knew an out gay person in their life. That's when they were more likely to be um, accepting of gay marriage and, and, and gay couples. Um, and I think that trans folks can have a similar trajectory. I think as we become more visible, yes, there's going to be a backlash um, from people who don't understand. But if we can get um, education out there and people talking openly, mm -hmm. I think humanizing people exactly really is what it's about. Yeah, I think it'll it can be a winning issue eventually. So both of you have mentioned or Oregon specifically being a little more friendly to LGBTQ plus folks, especially when it comes to policy lawmakers, that sort of thing in general. Um, have you heard from people moving to Oregon for those reasons? I mean, what's what what are you hearing from them? Yeah, definitely. We're um, aware um, anecdotally of a lot of folks moving to Oregon from other states um, really over the last decade, but we've seen it kind of an increase in the last couple of years mm -hmm. as states, you know, for example, in um, Texas, they um, said that parents could be, you know, accused of child abuse just for supporting their trans children and getting them the medical care they need. And so people who have the means um, are certainly choosing to move here. Uh, we're also seeing you know, if lower income folks coming here because 
they want to be able to exist as a trans person and then still needing um, housing and all those things right. that, uh, that everyone needs. Um, and so that's another reason why Oregon really needs to, you know, make sure it it has uh, sufficient housing for everyone. Right, and on that note, um, yeah. let's talk about homelessness because mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus people are really uh, overrepresented when it comes to the homeless community and people not having affordable housing, living on the streets. What should be done from a perhaps a policy level, a community level? How, how do we help these people and, and, and avoid that from happening? Right, so I think, um, you know, and we're not a direct service organization, but I think um, making sure shelters are, um, you know, we have different options that are welcoming to people who maybe don't fit into one of the two binary gender right. categories. That's a big issue that we, you know, see folks experiencing. We also have a workplace training program um, and we've had uh, shelters and other clients go through that so that they know how to work with clients who are LGBTQ+. Um, I'd say a related issue, I know that a lot of um, LGBTQ plus homeless folks are youth um, and LGBTQ plus youth, right, they're more likely to be kicked out of their home or, or choose to leave because it's an unsafe environment. Um, and that's why we have started becoming more involved in advocating for youth in the foster system right? Um, and making sure that they have accepting homes. And we're going to be talking a lot about that in yeah. our next, uh, after the break. So while we're on that note, LGBTQ plus youth way overrepresented in the foster care system as Blair is uh, referencing. So we're going to talk about this when we come back and what Basic Rights is doing to find safe places for kids to live. We'll also take a look at pride celebrations around the state. We're back after this. And welcome back. We're talking today with Basic Rights Oregon about their efforts to combat an increase in anti-LGBTQ plus legislation and attacks. I'm joined by Gabby Gardner and Blair Stenvik. Thank you both for being with us still today. Uh, so one thing your organization is doing is really working on recruiting LGBTQ plus parents to be foster parents. So Blair, let's start with you. What type of work is your organization doing in this sphere and why is this a priority? Right, absolutely. So it's a priority because we know through national data that um, LGBTQ plus youth are overrepresented in the foster system. Uh, you know, that's for a range of reasons. Um, you know, sometimes they can be kicked out, sometimes they can choose to leave because they feel unsafe in their homes or unaccepted. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because of that, they're also more likely to be homeless or, you know, get into the criminal court system, all these things that, you know, we want to avoid. Um, and even within foster homes, you know, not every parent is accepting or, you know, willing to take in uh, queer trans kids. And so we recently partnered with uh, DHS to and uh, a great organization called Unicorn Solutions to host recruitment events for potential LGBTQ plus affirming foster parents. So you don't have to be queer trans yourself. Mm -hmm. You just have to be, you know, willing to, to taking these kids and accept them as they are and advocate for them. And I'm sure there's some great resources with those organizations for any parents who might, or any people who might be interested in becoming foster parents. Absolutely, yeah. So on this note, Oregon DHS specifically mandates that foster parents, they must accept, they must affirm support a foster child's LGBTQ plus identity. And a case that recently made headlines was when a woman in Malheur County was denied the ability to be a foster foster parent because she refused to support LGBTQ identities, she said, because of her Christian religious beliefs. So why is it important, Blair, for foster parents to be accepting of the children that they do take into their homes? What sort of long lasting impacts are we talking about here? Yeah, thanks so much for asking that. Um, you know, as a foster parent myself, what I've learned is that it's not my job to shape who the kids in my home are or become. And I think that's something uh, a lesson that any parent can benefit from. You never know who you're gonna kids kids are going to grow up to be, whether they're you know biologically yours, foster, adopted, um, and it's your job as a parent to champion them. Um, you know when kids aren't accepted for who they are, um, that can lead to a whole slew of you know unfortunate situations. Um, it can lead them to bounce around to different foster homes, uh, trying to find a more supportive environment. And we know that every time a kid is displaced and have to move, that is its own trauma. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that any time a kid has come into the foster system, you know, they've experienced something um, unsafe or sad or uncomfortable in their life that is causing them to come in. And the last thing they need is to go into a new home where they don't even know you 
that, that they haven't grown up there and then have to face uh, you know, you trying to make them into something that they're just not going to be. Additional trauma in their lives. Yeah. 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 Uh, a topic we're going to jump into, Gabby, I know you're pretty skilled in this arena, um, and, and this is a very large topic that we hear a lot about these days. We've seen several efforts around the country and here in Oregon to ban certain books from school libraries, many of them because they're written by LGBTQ plus people, or perhaps they deal with those themes. So in West Lynn, a group of conservative mothers tried to get eight books pulled from the library library there. Half of them had LGBTQ plus content in those books. Well, the students in the district urged the school board to keep the books. Ultimately, a review board decided that they can stay. Now, this has not been the case in all districts around the country. Of course, we've seen. So, Gabby, what's your take on, on this effort to um, to ban books in schools and in some cases even in public libraries? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had another incident where the um, the Tiger Library was going to have a drag reading event and that had to unfortunately get canceled because um, the library in congruence with the police department in that area decided it was going to be unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a national coordinated effort um, around the guise of parents' rights in education to um, promote book bans, to take out gender inclusive facilities out of capital construction projects and school districts. Um, and we are seeing this in our state just as strong as other states. And so um, we have to make a coordinated effort to try to fight against that. And so it's not uh, you know, just, uh, just about the book bans and the books that we're talking about here. Really, this is big picture when it comes to school board elections, how, who we see get elected to school boards and how they really have become a battleground, I think it's fair to say, for a lot of these issues with the way gender identity is taught, sexuality, all of that. Um, so what is Basic Rights Oregon doing on that front? Because that is such a big topic that we hear about these days is the school board, school boards. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we really got our grounding in 2021 when um, Newburgh School Board decided to ban political symbols such as Pride and Black Lives Matter flags in the school district. And um, we're a statewide organization, but this was our call to action to get involved in local politics. And so really the best long-term solution is trying to talk with people who who are pro-equality and want to see every student, including trans students in the school district, to have a safe and inclusive learning environment. And so we really got into it full throttle with um, talking to candidates who um, were running for election within um, this year's school, school board election and um, making sure that the folks who we were vetting were um, pro-equality, who understood the um, guidance from the state of Oregon, the Oregon Department of Education. We actually worked on um, guidelines to make sure that LGBTQ 2SIA plus um, students success um, is a priority within that policy. I think it's about a 50 page document that outlines some really great things for school districts to follow. And so just talking to people to make sure that they're even trying to get to adhering to basic Oregon law. Um, and um, it was wildly successful this um, this year round. We actually, out of the 18 candidates that we endorsed, we um, had 15 of them win. So um, some good strides in that area. Are you hearing just anecdotally from people who, because the school boards have just become such a contentious issue at times and meetings get very heated between parents and school board members and students, are you finding some resistance from people when it comes to wanting to be on their local school boards? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I think that, um, and oftentimes these elected positions are unpaid too, right? So it's a lot of volunteer time. Um, but I think that um, it, it also, um, there is some resistance from folks who I, you know, are people of color or who are LGBTQ themselves because oftentimes the identity that they hold mm -hmm. puts a target on their back right. for folks. Um, so um, it's important for us to talk about long-term strategies to help um, not only get people elected, but also support them once they're in office. So we've talked about some pretty heavy topics today, some really, um, you know, sad things and unfortunate things happening around the country. So let's talk about some, some positive stuff happening, shall we? So we're about a month out from Pride Month during the month of June, typically, and uh, we have the big Pride events normally in June, but we just uh, wrapped up in July celebration just a few weeks ago. So this year, we had a lot of Pride celebrations in the suburbs, some in small towns, some of them held their first ever Pride events as well. So in the wake of all of this negative news, I mean, it does seem like people are still excited, you know, to push back. They're excited to speak up and show up. So what are you, what are you guys seeing? 
We're seeing a lot of excitement. We're seeing a lot of pride. Um, we have gone to um, about 18 different pride events throughout the state of Oregon over the last couple of months. Um, they usually start in early June, and I think we have one in Ashland that ends in October. Um, so it really is pride for about a couple months for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and um, we, we've seen a lot of attendance. Um, I personally have seen a lot of youth come out and you know be their true authentic selves. A lot of support from community um, and just just a lot of invigoration around um, the the call to action that folks are seeing and the importance to make sure that we're building community and solidarity with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, uh, what's can, your take on that? Yeah, I want to share a story. Um, so as Gabby mentioned, uh, the Tigard Public Library was forced to cancel a drag uh, story time event because there was a, a threat to public safety. Mm -hmm. um, the very next day after they had to cancel it, that was when uh, the city of Tigard hosted its uh, Pride event um, in June. And I uh, was there tabling for Basic Rights Oregon. And uh, it felt like there was just such a big turnout, bigger than I was expecting. Um, there were, you know, a lot of folks there, uh, like the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and Dykes on Bikes were there just to sort of informally make sure that folks stayed safe. Um, and people had such a uh, such a good energy. So it was really great to see, like, yes, you know, uh, people who want us to stay quiet were successful in canceling this one event, but they can't. Right cancel pride. Yep. So, yeah. People yeah. still showed up and yep. uh, in symbolism really too. Yeah. 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 Um, so we also saw people around the country show up to celebrate the life of a gay icon and a legend, a true legend in our drag community. And that is Darcel you're seeing here. Darcel, she died earlier this year. Her funeral was just packed. We had local lawmakers and leaders. They show up. They talked all about her impact uh, over the decades of her life. What does that tell you? Yeah, I mean, I think it tells us that, you know, here in Portland, uh, we're fortunate to have a lot of support for our LGBTQ plus community. Um, it also shows, you know, I know um, politicians right, are trying to demonize drag across the country, but you just can't deny when you see footage like this that it's about joy mm -hmm. and it's about, it's an art form and it's about bringing people together. Um, our office just happens to be uh, around the corner from Darcells where they did the dragathon and uh, that energy that day, I remembered, I, I didn't get to go in because I had to work, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I did get to, you know, s talk to some folks in line and people were just so happy to be there and part of it. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with this, this was earlier this month, um, Darcel Showplace, they hosted this 48 hour dragathon and people came from all over the place to watch performances. This was um, to support the Trevor Project as well. I mean, it was just incredible to see the turnout. The, Larry, you mentioned the energy people lined up outside. Does that give you optimism? I mean, I know you couldn't go, but when you're at your office and you saw that outside, does it give you some hope, I, I suppose? Oh, absolutely, yeah, because what that shows really to me, I mean, Darcel was just fully herself, right? And, you know, they can try to shut us down, but they're never gonna stop us from existing no matter what, and we're always gonna find this joy and find this art. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, each of you, we have about a minute left, a little over. I'm hoping you can give us a, a call to action, um, some sort of message. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you kind of to, to take the floor from there. Gabby, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think um, just to start off, um, you can go to our website, basicrights.org. Um, we usually keep people in the loop about um, political actions that we're involved with throughout the year. Um, and um, help donate to our cause um, because we are working every day to fight for legal and lived equality. And your website? basicrights.org. Great, and Blair, I'll give you the final word. Yeah, um, to go off of what Gabby said, uh, if you donate uh, through this weekend, you do get a free sticker. It's the <laughs> trans flag and it says uh, trans people belong here. We gave them out at Pride, they were a big hit. Um, you can stick it on your water bottle or whatever and just show everywhere you go, trans people belong there too, because we do. Wonderful, thank you both so much. Again, thanks to Blair and Gabby from Basic Rights Oregon. Thanks for joining us today. And you can find out more about the work they're doing. I'll give you the website again, basicrights.org. Laurel is back next week for a conversation with Oregon Senator Ron Wyden. In the meantime, you can catch Straight Talk as a podcast. You can download that wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks again for being here.